we want those students also engaging with two other groups, right? We want them not just engaging with each other in their academic silos, which we are very good at doing, but to get them out of their comfort zone and be able to set, take the engineer and the sociologist and the agricultural economist and the agronomist, to take them out into the field with the farmer and have them understand the, the, the system, the agricultural food, energy, water system from the perspective of the stakeholder. That may seem simple, but that's a pretty radical move for a PhD science, science level yeah. training. Something to Chew On is a podcast devoted to the exploration and discussion of global food systems. It's produced by the Office of Research Development at Kansas State University. I'm Maureen Olevnik, Coordinator of Global Food Systems. I'm Scott Tenona. I'm a philosopher of science. And I'm John Fabian. I'm a food scientist. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the K-State Global Food Systems podcast, Something to Chew On. In today's podcast, we are switching gears to shine some light on an area of the food system that may not be overtly understood as critical by many. But in many ways, human interactions and relationships within a given culture will guide people on how they eat, accept scientific findings in producing food, and interact with one another in economic, political, and sometimes contested spaces. The social aspects of human nature are major drivers in approaches to critical questions, willingness to adjust lifestyles or working norms, and interest in social drivers of using natural resources in a much divided time. Today's guest is Dr. Matt Sanderson, the Randall C. Hill Distinguished Professor of Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work, and Professor of Sociology at Kansas State University. Matt is currently exploring social drivers of natural resource use. This work concentrates especially on agricultural production and water consumption in the High Plains Ogallala Aquifer region of the United States. Our guest today is Dr. Matt Anderson, and Matt is coming to us from the sociology department at Kansas State University, and we're really excited to have you here today, Matt, and understand better where the sociological aspects of your research fit into the global food system overall. Before we get started in the discussion, um, as we normally do, I'd like to hear from you a little background on who you are and, and what brought you to the point of your area of study. What, what got you interested in sociology and, and working in this area? Oh, gosh. Well, thank you for having me on today. It's, it's a real pleasure. Glad to be here. And I usually, most people that know me, no, I don't really like talking all that much about my myself, but uh, how I got interested in sociology and sort of how that connects with the global food system. Long story short, I was an undergraduate major here in, at K-State in, in business. I was a finance major with a minor in economics and decided uh, after right around 9-11, it was 2001, 9-11, and I decided there were some big questions that I still had after completing that the bachelor's degree, and so I made a big shift and went back to try to study something that I thought would give me more insights into humans and how humans work and why the world sort of works the way it does. I was very interested. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't have the language or the way of framing these questions, but I was very interested in questions about the market and about power and about inequality, and about how that works to shape human behavior and influence things like culture and the social structure and norms and values around us and so on. So sociology, I took a, I took a jump. I, I applied uh, and, and looked at different programs in political science and sociology. I landed in sociology mainly because it, it, I didn't have a great reason other than it seemed broad enough to answer the questions that I had, which were very big. And, you know, that's a strength and a weakness of the field. 
uh, it's Brett. Um, but I loved it. And so I thought, well, I could do anything for four semesters. And if I don't like it, you know, trying a master's degree, I can, uh, I can go back and find a job in the banking world, the banking sector, the finance sector. And after two years, it'll still be okay. And I did the master's. I loved it. I said, well, I never really set out to get a PhD. Uh, I never thought about being a college professor, but here I am. So I guess this is the next step is to try look at the PhD. So I did that. And long story short, I went to a, a small, but very focused, concentrated, pretty re respected program at the university of Utah in Salt Lake city in comparative international sociology. And I was really studying what is now called global comparative sociology it was comparative international then. And so I'm a comparativist. I'm a historical comparative sociologist. I'm very interested in compare, making comparisons, analyzing social change over long periods of time and across cases or across places. So sort of longitudinal comparative designs. I finished the PhD. I got my first job in the middle of the right at the onset of the Great Recession in 2008. August of 08, I started my job, first job at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I was a joint appointment in, as a sociologist and their global studies, new initiative in global studies, which is this interdisciplinary center that tried to integrate different types of work going on at the university around issues of global importance, around health, environment, community, social change, those sorts of things. And I loved it. And I left that job only because there was an opening back at Kansas State, my alma mater, and it was this was 2011, and I decided that if I was offered the job, I'd come back, and here I am. So I've been back at K-State, back home at my alma mater since 2011. As my parents would probably tell you, they were very pleased, but they were also very surprised that we brought the grandkids back home and all, everything back home because I, I had spent most of my life trying to escape Kansas and especially rural Kansas where, where I had grown up. And so to come back in your thirties, I had never thought I'd come back ever. And here I am, but I decided that what would give me the most meaning is something that's driven me since the very beginning is not the attempt to, not the chance to make the most money. I, I could have done that with my business degree. It could have made a lot more money, but the chance to really try to impact, have positive change, impact the place that I, places that I call home in, in Kansas and especially rural Kansas and with the knowledge and skills that I have. And so it was time to come back home. And since 2011, I've been engaged in a number of areas, a number of different types of work in Kansas and the broader Great Plains but mostly engaging with rural communities around food, agriculture, rural community change. So in a nutshell, I mean, that's the last, what, 25, you know, 20, 25 years there. Uh, that's, that's how we ended up on this call in a, in, you know, a couple of minutes. That sounds great. Just out yeah. of curiosity, where in rural Kansas did you grow up? Yeah, it's not so rural anymore, uh, but I'm from, Spring Hill is where I went to high school, Spring Hill, Kansas, Southern Johnson County, Northern Miami County on the line there. It's now a bedroom community for Kansas City. Uh, 40 years ago, it was the fringe rural uh, outlying area of, of Kansas City, but it's changed a lot. A lot of subdivisions around now and so on. And my parents, my folks still live there and my brother still lives in that area as well. So still call that home. And I've been watching the change kind of, you know, sort of urban encroachment into that space for a long, long time and seeing that change. And I also have family, you know, throughout the Great Plains, Nebraska, Western Kansas, Oklahoma. So this region really is home in a, in a number of ways. How is your, how is your training up to this point and your experience up to this point, or has it conditioned the way you look back at those times 40 years ago when you were in Spring Hill? Do you, do you come to different conclusions yeah. now? That's a great question. I mean, I, 
one thing that sociology gives you that I'll never be able to fully repay uh, my teachers and professors, but it gives you what we come to call the a sociological imagination. And so what that means is that it gives you a lens through which you can understand yourself in the context of the larger society around you. And you can, you understand much more, much better about the forces and factors around you that shape you and are in your head and have interacted with your, literally the, the DNA in your body to help shape how you see and interact with the world and, and vice versa. It, it shows you how you change that very context that shapes people, the, the society, that you have an impact through every thought and every action that you have every day. There are literally thousands. We don't think about them. But every thought, every action is consciously remaking the very structures around us that make people, that shape people and who they are and who they can become. And so as I've gotten older and approaching, you know, middle age now, I definitely look at home and think about home differently. And I can't unsee what I've learned about the society around us and how that shapes people. So from a more sort of theoretical or even philosophical view, yes, for sure, having sociological training has reshaped how I think about home and what it, what that means and also given me an analytical lens to sort of diagnose and think about what's happening there and why and what to do about it. I noted that a lot of your work focuses on migration and the impact of migration in various, obviously globally, various parts of the world. Focusing down in on Kansas and the agricultural economy in Kansas, do you, have you done any work or do you focus at all on that aspect, the migration aspect on agricultural economy in Kansas? Yeah, sure, sure. So I'll back up a little bit and tell you how I got into this spot. I, I seem to have I don't think of myself as, you know, trying to be or very comfortable with very controversial things, but I sort of end up in the middle of these things. <laughs> 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 I think I'm more <laughs> because I, I study migration and I study water. And both of those things in rural Kansas are, can be very tension, uh, can generate tension and be, you know, controversial. So, but I, I'm a social scientist, or I think of myself that way. And so I try to understand and analyze with the lens and the tools that science gives us. And so with migration, yes, that was actually my entry point into studying rural environment issues, rural water issues, groundwater conservation, and so on. I wrote my dissertation on the relationship between migration and development. And this was a very, this is a cross-national study employing, you know, over 92 countries and uh, over the past 50 years, looking at statistically, what are the drivers of why people are moving across boundaries? And secondly, what are the consequences of those movements, of those migrations, those inflows on communities? How do we measure that? Is it, quote, good or bad? And for whom and for what and over what time period? These are the questions that I was motivated with in the, in the dissertation. I, I didn't start studying migration because I uh, was thought of myself as, a, as a necessarily an immigration expert. I studied it from the aspect of, of development. That's first and foremost what I'm interested in, this idea of social change, this idea of incessant uh, growth economically, socially, culturally, for positive benefit, this idea of development. That's what I was really fundamentally after by going into sociology. And so I started becoming more interested in migration because everywhere I looked with development, you see people moving and they're either moving out or they're moving in. People move. That is the, it's endemic to human societies. It goes back south. It is, it is the human story. It goes back to the beginning of humanity. People move. Now, the difference now is that we have things called national boundaries that never existed. So we have something called international migration that didn't exist 2000 years ago, or for that matter, even 600 years ago or 500 years ago. So now international, the movement of people 
seems more complex because we are fixed by national boundaries in places. But that is uh, by far the anomaly of the human condition. I mean, most humans have never lived, most humans that have ever lived in the face of the earth have never lived in one place their entire life. Most humans have walked around, figured, moved around, crossed all kinds of borders and so on all, through all life. So I was very interested in migration that way. And that led me, of course, from my experience in Kansas, I began being becoming very interested in Southwest Kansas because that was where growing up and throughout my childhood and youth and so on, I had heard about all the stories of immigration. So I naturally went to the place I was most comfortable with, and that was Southwest Kansas. And I tried to understand, given the tools I had, what's going on here? Why in Kansas, of all places, do we have this these inflows of immigrants, particularly Latino immigrants, but in the early 80s, also Southeast Asian immigrants as well. And today, Somalis, Burmese, and so on. How can we explain that? And what are the consequences of that? So I started looking at that, published a lot of work on that. I was trained as a social demographer. So I'm trained to look at population change, fertility, mortality, and migration. And Found out, found a lot of things about that, some of which are interesting and some of which are not probably, but I'm fascinated in all of it. And and that we could talk later if you want, but that's what led me ultimately into looking into groundwater conservation issues as well on the environment side, because I was trained in population and environment. Those were the two substance varies of training. It. On the population side, I look at migration. That was the first part of my career up through tenure. I looked at migration issues and then on the sort of second part of my career now, I've been looking more on the environment side and water, groundwater conservation and food and agriculture, integrated food system sort of stuff. Um, and it all comes together for me out there in Western Kansas. We have, it's, it's just a fascinating place. It's got the, it has water challenges. It has rural community challenges. It has population challenges and also lots of opportunities in these things as well. So I naturally find myself constantly, although people are leaving that area and they have been for a long time, I find myself going in the opposite way with my students. I, I'm traveling out in the middle of nowhere, western Nebraska, western Kansas, panhandles of Oklahoma, spending a lot of time out there trying to figure out what's going on and 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 really how do we how do we encourage, how can I help facilitate a more regenerative, resilient rural community in these places? What's the if you if you had to pick two or three top limiting factors to f flourishing of the, of those communities? What the, what might those be? Yeah, wow. Too much. It, I mean, there's there's immigration, but then there's yeah. diversity within the, the spot that has, they've been immigrating to, if you will, or migrating to. Yeah. Well, I think I think. Ten years ago, I would have said the limiting factor is something on sort of the population side, the human side, so something around immigrant density and those sorts of things, trust, those sorts of things in the community. Today, I think I think actually less and less about, and this may be anathema to as a social scientist to say, but today I think less and less about the human side than I do the the limiting factor of water, quite frankly. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, because without without water out there, none of that exists. Period. Mm -hmm. You don't have you, you don't have you don't have anything like a garden city without the Ogallala Aquifer underneath it. Period. Mm -hmm. So so you'll have a lot fewer people as the groundwater levels decline, and we shift back to dry land up you know dry land agriculture out there, which some think is inevitable. Uh, and we're, argue, we're arguing over the timeline over which that happens, and more importantly, why that might be worth, why the water might be worth saving. But I spend less and less time actually out there talking about community level dynamics, people to people relationships, than I do thinking about people to nature, people to environment, people to water relationships, and why that's so difficult. For a lot of sociologists, environmental sociology, which I'm sort of a part, I guess, is a real challenge to the field and my discipline because sociology developed as a purely, it was developed in the late 
some, there's a question over when it developed, but 19th century, post enlightenment, right? Industrial revolution. There's a lot of change going on. The transition from a rural to an urban society is fully in place in the late 19th century. Sociology really arises, is, you know, is birthed in that transition from a rural agricultural society to a modern, quote, modern industrial manufacturing based society and all the tensions and traumas that 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 brought about that's really what sociology focuses on and we're still there it and one of the founders Emile Durkheim a a French sociologist was really trying to set sociology apart from psychology and from some other social sciences that were emerging so I really think he went too far in trying to remove humans from the natural environment and make everything about humans themselves. So environmental sociology emerges in the mid late 20th century, very recently to try to re embed, put humans back in the natural environment and talk about things like physics and chemistry and biology and these sorts of things to sort of re re wed the human component that we've been looking about to these kind of biological chemistry, physics, relationships that we're looking at. Well, I know that at least one part of the state in the Southeast has been depopulated and and had significant problems because of their success in mining and the consequence of, of what yeah. brought them there. Is, does sociology seek to understand those forces as well and, and any attempts at, at, at finding other ways for those com- communities to, if not prosper, at least continue to stay together and not, not self disperse. Yeah. So that's a good question. And, and the analogy, the, the analogy or the case you bring up of mining communities is for better or worse now being applied to groundwater dependent communities. Wow. And so, yes, and that's controversial as well. I know, I know that. Uh, but if you talk with more than a few irrigators, they'll tell you, yeah, we're miners. We, mm-hmm. we mine the water. This is not, this is not a renewable resource out here. This is a finite resource, just like a coal seam. And when it's gone, it's gone, uh, you know, and then we get into some really deep stories about what that means for human values and why that's happening and whether that should happen. But more than a few also say, you know what? No, we, we, we need to pull back and we can extend the life of this thing, unlike a mining community in Southeast Kansas or West Virginia, for that matter. And we should have communities out here as long as we possibly can, because I or I or whoever goes back four or five generations, this place has meaning. It's worth saving and the water allows us to live out here. So let's get organized and try to figure out how we extend the life of this so I can pass it down to my kids and so on. And that's the conversation going on in a lot of these communities is, is is, even though it's not talked about that explicitly, it's do we want to look like, this will be controversial, but do we want to look like rural West Virginia or do we want to look like a more scaled down version of a sustainable version of, you know, Eastern Nebraska type rural community. What, what do we want to do? And those conversations that's active right now in Western Kansas, in church basements, in home. Now, maybe not as much with COVID because we can't get to face to face. So we'll say, Oh, we'll say over zoom or wherever. I mean, but those are the conversations that are taking place uh, out there. And, And they're not always talking explicitly like that, but they're really talking about, in a number of conversations, you know, who do we want to be? Where are we going? Humans are always trying to figure out what this means and who I am and where are we and how are we, where are we going forward? And we do as sociologists, I do as a sociologist work on issues of transition. So through a number of tools, you know, what do we want this place to look like and who do we want around us and why, and are we troubled by who's around us and why? And, what gives us meaning and, and hope and what challenges that and so on. So we work with those very issues. And I was struck by your mining example because there are increasingly examples being drawn between Southeast Kansas and Southwest Kansas. Yeah. That's hard to imagine the difference between Coffeeville and I don't know. What, yeah. You know, right. Southwestern Kansas. 
amazing. Yeah, or a place like Ulysses or Ulysses, Syracuse yeah. or yeah, right. someplace out over the over the aquifer where or if you go north, right around west of Scott City, where the water in in that area is already pretty low, uh, what's mm. left, and some wells are off now, or so on. And Northwest Kansas has got some areas too that are that are having some challenging times. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm working on a USDA project and and uh, on the Ogallala, and a number of us are starting to think about. Given we've been on this project, well, this will be the fifth year. We're going to be wrapping it up this year, but number of us are looking ahead and thinking about what's next. And a lot of the work that I did on that project is pointing to, really pointing to this idea of transitions, that some places are going to want to save the water as best they can, conserve it as best they can, extend the life as best they can, and some are not. And and that's community-led uh, change, choice, sort of self-determination, right? So how do we facilitate, how do we ease the transition back into a dry land form of agriculture with that base with a lot fewer people uh, operating a lot more land when a lot less capital? And, and, and in other areas, we're going to still have water to go after for 150 years or so, it looks like. Mm -hmm. So highly I, variable I, place to place too. Yeah, sounds interesting. I, I spent a number of years in Minnesota and in that case it was it was communities redefining themselves when there was no longer a timber industry to rely on and what, yeah. what were they going to do yeah. to keep the town alive or further north when uh, taconite mining was no longer profitable yeah. but they you know yeah. could they stay there or did they have to leave and it's in each case the solution was somewhat similar but somewhat different and and if they were well underway by the time I got there, but it would have been interesting to to see before, yeah, to see the before side of that. Yeah, exactly. I, fat, another interesting comparison in uh, with the forestry industry, the logging industry, and, and also think about think about how to transition and really what that means for the people that are living through those changes. Uh, and, and, and it's the same sort of dynamic, but the sort of population environment relations aren't exactly analogous, but the same sort of process here is in people's minds because we're talking really there about culture, about norms, values, and beliefs, and those don't change very easily or rapidly. And that's really what I think, you know, we've come to find out in a, in, in a lot of areas in our, in our world, in our, in our society is the economy moves, the population shifts, things, it's a very dynamic market-driven economy. It shifts quickly, the structures change, but culture does not. Culture lags. It, it, it does not automatically change when the economy changes. And that tension or that slippage between the economic change and the cultural lag is really the source of a lot of tension and contradiction and confusion and argument in our society a lot yeah, not stigmatization as well population in environment cases it, it's people, i'm sorry people are stigmatization people are, are tagged with with being adverse to whatever whatever amounted to progress or old-fashioned or inflexible there you go you know, in their views yeah yeah right and and then we argue over how fast should the change be or not, mm -hmm. and who benefits mm -hmm. from those changes. And that's that's really what we're, I think we're looking at over a lot of dimensions of society. It's very dynamic market-driven economy. If we're gonna have that, we're gonna have incessant continual change, transformation. But humans, that's a very new new thing in, in human affairs. If you go back over the scope of human history, 150, 180,000 years, most most humans that have ever walked uh, on the earth, right? They were born into one family. They had one role in that in that group, and then they died. And their kids would likely have the very same status, right? Yeah. And so yeah. we don't we don't live in that world. We live in a world that is much more open, dynamic. I'm worrying about unsustainable uh, on the resource side, but it's a much more dynamic, fast-paced change world. But Evolutionarily, I mean, we we evolved in groups that where change was very slow and incremental over time, thousands of years. So 
So we haven't caught up. Our culture lags. The things in our head around our values, norms, and beliefs, those things get shaped in a context. But the economy and the material parts are always moving forward and outpacing us. So we're arguing over where we should be and who we are all the time. <laughs> and that's a new idea for human humans. Those were given. Those were given questions for most of our species history. Who you are and what you were was where you were born and where you are. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> now we now we invent. Now we have to invent those things, and they're constantly being changes. And so we have identity crises. And we have them at various stages of our life, mm -hmm. kids, middle age. So, so anyway. Wow. So, Matt, you talked a little bit about some projects that you had worked on at K-State, one that was wrapping up. Can you give us some notion of some of the interdisciplinary research activities you've been involved with, maybe some specifics of different groups you're working with and some of the um, outcomes that you're looking for in those works? Yeah, sure. So. Just a little quick rundown of those. There was there's a USDA CAP coordinated ag project, CAP led by Chuck Rice here at K State and Megan Shapansky and Regan Wascom at Colorado State, involving collaborators. I think there's, I mean, the team is huge. It's 70 to 80 people total across mm -hmm. the seven states uh, over the aquifer. That project is, you know, in the in the no cost extension fifth year right now. It'll it'll wrap up. And really what we're looking at there is on the social side, I can't speak to the natural side of things, the agronomy side and so on, but on the social side, trying to understand, build an integrated model of, of uh, producer decision making. So under conditions of climate change, under conditions of market change, and under conditions of social change, and trying to build with a team of agricultural economists and agronomists and hydrologists and sociologists and a single model that can a predict what has or explain what has happened in this region but also b look ahead a little bit and say okay if these things change then we can expect these sorts of scenarios going forward in this region and bottom line we can expect these scenarios to affect groundwater levels over this time time horizon. That's really the outcome we're trying to look at is, is what will this do to the groundwater levels if we change this price, this quantity, this value, this social cultural component, what happens to groundwater levels? That is a fascinating project to have been involved with. And to some degree, five years feels like we're just getting started. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, but that's a massive, massive undertaking. And that's why it hadn't been done. It, it, these, you know, I worry about the time frame we're up against with some of these challenges in the in the material world. But five years, we've just we've built the data set, we've got the model running, but it feels like we need another five years. And I'm not just you know trying to ask USDA for more money, although I'm, we're going to be doing that. But five years feels like you know now we need to see how this works really because it took that long to build this thing and communicate with people and learn how they these other folks, how they talk and how we think as a team. So been involved with interdisciplinary things a long time. That's that's one example. Another example I worked on was with Marcellus Caldas and Jessica Heyer Stam and many others, some of whom have left K-State on a NSF project on coupled natural human systems, where we were looking in the Smoky Hill River Basin to try to, again, develop an integrated model of how humans and the environment interact with water over time in this particular place and what that means for levels in the Smoky Hill water and what that means for biodiversity in our in our streams and river and Smoky Hill River and our creeks and tributaries and what that means for farmers who are farming over this particular area. Trying to build a model of how if you change the some factors on the human side, what happens to the environmental aspects of that system, the water levels, the fish levels, and so on. Vice versa, if you have some external forcing event like a changing climate under different scenarios, what happens to the environment side, and how does that feed back in to affect the human dynamics of that system in a, in a feedback loop, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to build this integrated looped model of how this thing works over time in this in in that particular region of the Smoky Hills, so that's another project I was involved with, and 
another project I'm involved with and, and I'm involved with right now is, is called the, the NERT. Uh, it's a National Research Traineeship Award to Melanie Derby from the National Science Foundation. Mel- Melanie, Dr. Derby's in engineering and a team with Stacey Hutchinson and Nathan Hendricks and others, it's a big team as well, where we're trying to now it's a it's a graduate traineeship award. So all most all the money goes into funding graduate students in an interdisciplinary approach to science. And the top the focus of that project is the Ogallala Aquifer and farming systems over the Ogallala. So it's it has a bunch of acronyms, but it's R cubed Rural Resource Resiliency National Research Traineeship. And we're trying to figure out with students uh, and, a, and, a, and a little sort of sketch together curriculum that we're still building and developing as part of this project, how do we train the next generation of students, scientists, to work with each other on very complex problems to try to get some traction on these things, actually? So NSF's putting money into this sort of a program as, um, as a spearhead to kind of, I think, Okay, my own interpretation, really to try to get people out of their disciplines and into rooms thinking about complex problems together as a part of their graduate training so that when they leave the world, they leave the, their PhD, they're ready to talk with, an engineer is ready to talk with a sociologist and, and may not know, be an expert, but, but at least can have a conversation about what a model should look like and what sort of things a sociologist brings to the table and vice versa, how a sociologist could understand how an engineer, what they bring to the table and what are their, how do they look at the world as a starting point. As another aspect of that project, we want those students also engaging with two other groups, right? We want them not just engaging with each other in their academic silos, which we are very good at doing, but to get them out of their comfort zone and be able to take the engineer and the sociologist and the agricultural economist and the agronomist Take them out into the field with the farmer and have them understand the, the, the system, the agricultural food, energy, water system from the perspective of the stakeholder. That may seem simple, but that's a pretty radical move for a PhD science, science level yeah. training is to actually have people talking with stakeholders who are acting out the system that we're studying. But that's a part of it. So these students will spend time in Southwest Kansas with the research and extension folks out there, Jonathan Aguilar and Garden City. They'll spend time with farmers for a week or so this summer and again a little later. And then another co- group we want them interacting with are um, policymakers in Topeka. So these students, graduate students, PhD and master's students will spend time during when the legislature is in session and with COVID, that has been a real interesting deal, but try to get them together with, you know, have FaceTime with policymakers to learn vice versa about how policymakers look at food, energy, water issues as well to get some understanding of really trying to get between the farmers, the policymakers and the scientists trying to get some traction on what this system actually looks like from what, for, depending on the position you're in, in the system, if that makes sense. So involved, involved there too with this NERT. I'm very excited about it. And it's high risk, high reward. It, it has challenged me in a number of ways when I teach in that PhD seminar. Some sessions go well, some, some don't go well because we have a very diverse group of people, all very smart, but we it forces us as instructors professors to say how do we teach this how do we how do we how, how do we have to go back to basic pedagogy like how do we you know where do we start trying to teach systems thinking and and how do we get people seeing this from different angles so that we can actually use science to solve problems and not just study them that motivates me and so that challenge is very it's a big challenge, but it's very exciting. It motivates me. So those are three projects on interdisciplinary things. The last thing I'll say there, so I don't turn this entirely into a monologue, is uh, that with interdisciplinarity, I'm increasingly finding myself spending less time in sociology, and and that I don't like that some days because I feel very like much like a fish out of water a lot of days. 
swimming with the engineers and so on. But, but, um, but, but when you are in that world, it's also exhilarating because it's refreshing, it's new, and you really have to have a committed group of people that are willing to sit with each other and endure lots of communication problems, basically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and yeah, you got to be dedicated to learning how another person thinks because Ooh, you will not get anywhere if you just sit down and you know, give the traditional spiel that you give to, you know, your sociology students or your engineering right. students. So that's been challenging in this kind of second part of my career, but it's been a lot of fun working in interdisciplinary teams. And I, I think that's really how we're going to, if we're going to solve any of these big problems, we're going to have to get outside of our department, I think. I was wondering if you could, yeah, if you could give an example of one of the kinds of things about the human environment interaction that, that really that really matter for understanding these systems, right? So what what are the kinds of values or beliefs or norms that that you're talking about that, that come up that are, you know, maybe interesting or surprising about the effects they have or about the ways the the changes in the environment are affecting those? Because that's, you know, you're studying both ways, right? That's right. So yeah, it's a great question. So one of the things that I've sort of zeroed in on over the years and narrowed the focus on is culture. I didn't set out to study culture, but I'm open, like to think I'm somewhat open-minded about as a social scientist, I sort of am driven, led down the path that the data lead me and they've increasingly led me to culture. When I opened up that box of culture, it was a black box. I, it, 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 there are a lot of moving parts, but I don't know how they all work. Theory, there's theories about how culture works at the collective level, at the group level, but also at the individual level within the, the mind itself. And as I've sort of focused more in on culture, I become very interested in how culture responds to environmental changes both in the social environment, but also in the natural environment, and vice versa, how culture, human ideas, really, non-material ideas in their heads, shape the landscape, shape the atmosphere, shape the water system, right? So I'm very interested in that two-way feedback and looking at culture and these, these relationships. So um, there are a lot of findings coming out from this work. I'll point to a few. I think I think one of the bigger ones is the this idea that um, values, held values, affect natural outcomes, right? So with held values, we're talking about fundamental ideas, guiding principles about right and wrong, good and bad, just, unjust, fair, unfair. These are these are human constructs. These are made up ideas. They, they all come from somewhere, but ultimately they're held in human minds and humans can change them. And we do. We change these things on various timescales and they are malleable. That gives us some hope that change is possible in our relationship with the natural environment. That change is possible in our relations with other humans. These things, these values, while they're very deeply held, and they don't change quickly often, they can change and they do change on varying time scales and varying spatial scales. So what we found, what I found with a bunch of graduate students, and I would list them, Stephen Lauer just graduated, a fantastic graduate student, Amariah Fisher in the geography department, I'm working with her, lots of good students working on these things. What, what we found is that there are different types of values, first of all, not a huge surprise, but more, more importantly, that these value sets seem to drive worldviews, ideas about the world, and those values and worldviews together really shape something as material as the flow of water in a stream. Okay, that sounds maybe far out, far-fetched, but you, you can see these effects in the models, in the statistics, in the data, right? So... People, there are different types of values. There are really like five different types of value sets 
from this, the perspective I'm working within. There are environmental or biospheric values. There are more humanistic, altruistic values. There are values that are oriented more toward traditionalism. There are values oriented towards self-interest, egoistic values, we call them. And there are values around openness to change and change itself. These five types of value sets really shape landscape, and they also shape interactions in group settings. What we found in a nutshell is that people, not surprisingly, holding stronger environmental values, more deeply held values around relations between humans and the environment, right and wrong, what we should or should not do with or to the the natural environment. People holding stronger environmental values farm differently. And when they farm differently, that has different that has clear effects on things like land use and land cover change. That has very clear effects on water levels. That has very clear effects at a scale way beyond the farm level or even Western Kansas that has very clear effects on atmospheric levels of carbon. So people, vice versa, that have, and I'm speaking generically here, the data get more nuanced and complex, and that's all in journal articles, but people that hold more uh, strong traditional values and self-interest values farm differently than people with stronger altruistic and environmental values. I'll step back and say that in a couple things about that, uh, people over the Ogallala Aquifer, the, the producers, the farmers, and so on, they hold each of these values to varying degrees. No one scores zero on any of these five values. And I talk a lot about that with students. In a world where we polarize ourselves and put ourselves into camp, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm a progressive, I'm a conservative. I'm a farmer, I'm a urban citizen, you know, we have all these values we put on people. I give these tests, these values tests often to students in class. And one thing that always strikes them uh, is that nobody scores zero on any of the values. We all hold them to varying degrees. And so in that, there's a lot of commonality in shared values. There's just different degrees of commonality or difference. And that breaks down a lot of barriers when you can start thinking about values that way and shared values in that way. That breaks down a lot of barriers to trust and, and, and in trying to produce some sort of positive change. So nobody holds, no farmer holds these uh, zero on any of them or, or five on all of them for that matter, or, or high levels on all of them either. They're all sharing them to some degree and there's some difference. The next thing I'll say is that in places that get labeled as flyover country and more pejoratively as redneck land and places where there's just a lot of backwards people and so on and conservative and this, that, and the other, i.e. much of rural America, when you actually give, when you actually look at values, when you actually look at beliefs, you actually look at norms, you measure them you see a lot of diversity out there. That's, I was struck. Uh, Surprise, surprise. (laughs) There's a lot of diversity. And yeah, and you can see it in the the data, in the data, right? And we look at, we, we talk with urban folks as well, and we give them the same questions and we look at the data. Yes, there is a rural urban difference on sort of conjunctions or groups of these clusters. But there's also a lot of shared values between these two groups that I think get drowned out in the noise, in the day-to-day sort of we're different or they're backward or we're better or whatever it is, right? So, and here I'm just talking about farmers. I'm not, I just surveyed farmers and there's tremendous diversity Mm -hmm. in farmers in Western Kansas. Who would have known? Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're not all the same. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They have different ideas and they have different worldviews. And Some of them are operating under more constraints, financial, social, than others. But there is a a degree of shared values operating there amidst diversity, is what I'm saying. So long way of answering that was we sort of looked narrowed down on culture and especially on values and worldviews to try to understand how that shapes landscape change, how that shapes environmental change, and vice versa, how those changes then come back and reshape culture 
reshape the ideas that are in humans' heads about farming over long time periods, right? So, yeah, so how what's the best way to be, or what are some different ways about thinking about that diversity, right? Instead of looking at the map and seeing, you know, all of Kansas or all of Western Kansas, like a one color, right? But But once you see the diversity in everybody's views, how should that shift our thinking about land use, about water use, and and how to how to like adjust policy? Because you're you're talking about on the one hand like individual values, right? But then we're also talking about you know collective decisions and and general policies and individual actions that affect other people. So so how do you translate that that understanding of the diversity of views into thinking about water use and, and farming? Well, yeah. So it's a good question. And it it really gets back to this agency structure debate that's been going on in sociology, social science, I'm sure humanities philosophy as well for a very long time. And that debate basically is about individual and society, self and society. How do, to what degree are these aligned or misaligned? And and when we when we talk about natural resource management, they're in a, of a common pool resource, which is what we have with the Ogallala. They're all drawing essentially uh, from the same bathtub. They each put a straw right. Each irrigator puts a straw down into the into the, uh, t- the tub, and when they pull it out it lowers the levels other places. So we have a common pool resource problem where one person's actions affect another person and in some degree in unknown ways still. Now the hydrogeology has got a lot better about that. We can measure well levels and so on. And Kansas Geological Survey does that very well annually and so on. Um, Not my area, but my understanding is Kansas is really a leader in being able to measure this resource, this, this water compared to places like California, Central Valley, and so on. But we do have a common pool resource. It raises questions about fairness, about power of any one actor and what they can do to other actors in the system, fairly or unfairly. And so enter you know, a project where we're asking questions about what should we do with the water that's left? And that raises all these questions of, well, if Joe or Jill or Susie or Bob pulls this water out, you know, I'm out of, I'm out of luck and they've got more wells and they've got more money and so on. These people working on these have been wrestling with these questions long before a little, you know, token sociologist comes along and starts asking these questions. I think what a sociologist can bring to that conversation is to try is the is the skills to try to make our values more explicit and put them on the table in a structured discussion facilitation environment and allow people who are at the table to make decisions about this shared resource that they otherwise wouldn't make uh, in their own house or with their own farm family or they'd otherwise I don't want to say we're facilitators or adjudicators like, you know, mediators or legal processes by any means, but where otherwise you would resort to, you know, you know, suing the neighbor or doing this, that or the other, make sure that your water was protected. Say, okay, as a community level, at a community level, what, what do we want to happen uh, and why? And there, as you just heard from the discussion about values, there's a lot of diversity in the responses about what should happen with that water and why it should happen. But very few people are explicitly acknowledging their fundamental ideas about right and wrong in those conversations. They're drawing on what we call a cultural toolbox that they're given, and they don't really question it because it's so deep in their mind. They've been so socialized. They don't, it's just not, their opinion is right and it's natural because it just is. That's the only thing. Uh, that they know it's right, it's fair, you know. Uh, when you open up that box and allow conversations about, well, why do we want to save water? For who? Who benefits about that? 
And why do why would we want to conserve this? Why would we not want to conserve it? You don't you do start up discussions about tradition and convention and altruism toward others or lack thereof and the environment and you really more deeply at the deepest level and this is what we've been looking a lot at over the past year or two you really open up bigger conversations about identity and who people are and what gives their life meaning and the water out there is really allowing these things to these these conversations these these feelings these ideas about who they are to to manifest sort of on the landscape. But they're asking questions about fundamentally about who I am and uh, what am I doing? And those are questions in turn about, and this gets very provocative, but about humans and the natural world at the deepest level, about God and about your idea of reality and about often as, I said in some public talks, whether you ultimately think that God put the water in the ground for you to use it, or whether that's not the case. And those discussions are rarely happening in policy circles. <laughs> those are never happening in policy. We're arguing there about uh, rights and legalities. Underlying all that, what I'm trying to say, underlying all that is a whole nother level that isn't talked about but is really driving those discussions. And that's where I want to be. I want to be at the underneath level of the real driving motivation for people's actions. Right. And that's what we're trying to do with this, with these and very humbly and with these projects. Yeah, that That's incredibly hard work, but, but I guess the idea is yeah, that right. then, but yeah, you, you make, you make these underlying things a little bit more explicit and then you're also able to point out where, where there are commonalities, right, and give a give a place for discussion so that the there's possibility for for agreement at another level, I guess. Yes, and so exactly. So, who am I to say whether we should conserve water in Western Kansas? Uh, that's a controversial statement as well, because of course Kansas water law says the water in the under the ground in Kansas is to be used for the benefit of all Kansans. I don't not uh, maybe not a lot of people are aware of that, but Kansas has a very very interesting water law that Texas does not have. Texas has right of capture, which says if the water is under your ground, you do with it what you want and for your benefit. Kansas doesn't say that. Kansas water law says the water under your ground is to be used for the. It's called the beneficial use clause. The water under your property is your right property right but it is to be used for the benefic benefit of the citizens of the state of Kansas, right? So bringing people together and at least making explicit why we're doing what we're doing with water in this place is I think the least that should be done because if, even if it does, we, we, it, it's pumped dry, we will know why we did it. There will be no mistake about why it was done if we talk about our values. Otherwise, if we never if we never have that conversation, uh, it'll be which we may never get to that level on the scale we need. But mm -hmm. if we never have that conversation, we're going to argue a lot about this water law or that water law or this 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 farmer or that farmer. And the conversation I'm much more interested in is. Um, it is about why we did why we're doing what we're doing and if we collectively as a group decide that it's not worth saving or we're not, we don't think it's this is there's a reason why this is in the ground it's to be used and so on uh at least our heirs and our ancestors will know why we did what we did whether we conserved it or not uh and we'll be explicit about that I don't think it's too much to ask, but it's very controversial and very hard work for sure. Fascinating. I really appreciate the the input that you gave us. This was a very, very interesting discussion and uh, brought to light a lot of of areas to consider when we are looking at some of the 
hard science problems. Uh, you know, water usage is obviously one of the areas that you've been most heavily focused on, but um, I, I really appreciate your time and this has been really great. No, this has been a great conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. No, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to share something about what I've learned and what, what we've been doing and, and why we're doing it. Uh, one last thing, uh, Marina, and not to get on you, this is a very common uh, thing, but you listen to what I've been talking about and so on. I think we'll have to start talking about all sciences as the hard sciences now. Engineering students and with always talking about hard science and soft science, and I'm not at all opposed. I, uh, many things about what I do are soft in the sense that they're fuzzy, they're unknown, there's a lot of uncertainty, we don't have a lot of precision in the measures and so on. I feel like what we're doing is maybe the hardest science. I never miss an opportunity to point it out. So I'm not calling you out directly. I'm just saying in general, hard and soft sciences. I don't know. Maybe we need a new dichotomization of the world, of our science. But more on that later for another podcast. <laughs> very, <laughs> very fair. Fair comment. Yeah, another conversation. So <laughs> you guys help me out here. You'll have to help me come up with the right word to differentiate between between the between the two approaches. But um, well, again, I really appreciate your time. This has been a enlightening conversation. It's been really great. Keep up the good work. Thanks so much. If you have any questions or comments you would like to share, check out our website at ksu.edu backslash research backslash global food and drop us an email. Our music was adapted from Wayne Gowen's album, Chronicles of Carmela. Special thanks to him for providing that to us. Something to Chew On is produced by the Office of Research Development at Kansas State University.